Rejoice. Jesus won. The tomb is empty. He conquered both sin and death and sealed within our hearts the guarantee of eternal life. The anthem of every church must be centered on the resurrection. If there was not resurrection, where would our hope be? How could we face the bad news when there is no guarantee of the good news? Jesus came, suffered, died, and rose again. Today, let's proclaim the good news to all we see. Sing the good news, share the good news, live by the good news. The resurrection is far better than any hope we can have in this world. Let me remind you, the tomb is empty. When life is difficult, remind yourself the tomb is empty. When you are weak, sick, scared, or anxious, remember the tomb is empty. He came not only to suffer and die, but to have everlasting life. By trusting in Him, you will experience the same everlasting life. Sin and death have no mastery over you. In His name, we have overcome. In Him, we can endure. In Him, we can one day experience the glory of heaven where death is not welcome there. Rejoice today. Above Easter lunches, egg hunts, social media pictures, and other obligations, let's lift high the name of Jesus. He is the reason why we celebrate Easter. He is alive. Hallelujah. Amen. Judson, uh, I'm Craig Zook, and our scripture this morning is from Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and the flute. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's praise God together in prayer. Our Father, we are so thankful, Lord, for you and for the God that you are, the God that is faithful to us, a God who is long-suffering and merciful and gracious and forgiving. Thank you, Father, for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross to pay for our sins so that we could be holy and righteous before you. Thank you, God, for sending your Holy Spirit to abide in us, to give us the power to do your bidding, to do your will, to be obedient to you. 
thank you, Father, for this great opportunity to serve you at Judson. We thank you for all these things and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So much has changed since last Easter. The world has been shaken. Life has been disrupted. What we once called normal seems like it may never return. It's been easy to be discouraged, to lose hope, to feel the foundations of our faith begin to crumble. It's hard to keep our feet planted when the ground beneath feels like shifting sand. Now more than ever, we need to stand on the truth of Easter, a day which changed our eternity, changed our world forever. Death was defeated by life. Sin was consumed by mercy. The grave was swallowed up by victory. See, even in the darkest of moments, the love of Jesus could not be stopped. His faithfulness could not be broken. And when the dust settled, Jesus, he stood alive and victorious. Today, may we remember the truth of Easter, the power of the resurrection, and the promise of eternity. Yes, the world has been shaken, but the grave, it's still empty. And Jesus, he's still risen. my mind to Calvary where Jesus fled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone messiah still and all alone oh praise the name of the lord His name forevermore For endless days We will sing your praise O Lord, O Lord our God And on the third At break of dawn The Son of Heaven rose up who oh, trampled death, where is your sting? The angel roared for Christ the King. Who oh, praise the name of the Lord our God? Who oh, praise His name forevermore? For in this day. Shall return in 
in robes of white The blazing sun shall pierce the night And I will rise among the saints My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face Easter Sunday morning, we wanted to share communion together. And although our minds are really focused on the resurrection, we look at as a reminder of the covenant that we have with God, the death of Jesus is part of that as well. And so allow me to read from the book of Philippians as uh, we look at this covenant that we have. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he were in the form of God, did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we celebrate today communion. And so let me just invite you to take the elements that you have there at home uh, as we get ready for this communion. We're going to share it together. Then I'm going to close with our Easter prayer for the day. So if you'll just take the bread. It was on the night in which Jesus was born. He took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Take and eat. And so let me just have you repeat these words right where you are as you take communion. This is the body of Christ given to us. Well, it was the same way after the supper, he took the cup, representing the new covenant that was made because of Jesus' blood. There's no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And by Jesus being the perfect sacrifice for us, his blood shed covers our sin. And so let me just invite you to take the cup that you have. And as you repeat these words after me, I'll ask you to drink it and be thankful. This is the blood of Jesus shed for us. As we share this Easter prayer, I know you don't have it before you, but it is a prayer written by Hippolytus. Um, And uh, let me just read this prayer, uh, but then you can pray it along with me. Christ is risen. The world below lies desolate. Christ is risen. The spirits of evil are fallen. Christ is risen. The angels of God are rejoicing. Christ is risen. The tombs of the dead are empty. 
Christ is risen indeed from the dead, the first of the sleepers. Glory and power are his forever and ever. Amen and amen. How would you describe the best day ever? A trip to the toy store with all the money you got on your birthday? A day at the super fun amusement park? Going to the beach with a friend? The best day ever actually happened 2,000 years ago. You see, God loves you so much. Way before you were ever born, He knew your name. He knew everything about you. He loved you so much. So much that He sent His Son Jesus to earth. You see, we are each sinners. And that means we have disobeyed God. Jesus came to die on the cross so that our sins, our bad choices, could be forgiven. Thankfully, he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead and is alive today. He is preparing a home for you in heaven, where he wants you to live forever. A trip to the toy store, a day at the amusement park, a time at the beach are all pretty special. But nothing is as special as the day that Jesus rose from the grave so you could live forever with him. That was the best day ever. As we turn to the scriptures this morning, generally on Easter, we look at the, one of the resurrection of passages, but we've been looking at the teaching of Jesus. And the parables that we're going to look at today are uh, parables of about lost things and found things. And the reason that these are we're, we're sharing these today is because Easter is really about Jesus teaching about finding lost things and lost people. And so if you take your Bibles and open, open to Luke 15, Luke 15 is probably the passage I've preached on most in the 22 years here I've been at Judson, because I think in it lies the core of our understanding that Jesus came to bring people who are lost to him. So let's read this this morning, beginning with verse number one of Luke 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you. There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And what woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? But when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. May the Lord teach us this morning. Now he didn't go on to complete the story of the, what we call the prodigal son. Um, I think it's better aptly called maybe the waiting father or the prodigal sons. But the story is a very familiar story to most of us. It's a story in which the one son takes his inheritance and goes, lives a wild life, loses everything, and ends up feeding pigs and longing after the food that the pigs uh, were eating. He decided, as he remembered his father, he thought, well, my father will at least accept me as a servant. So he decided to come home. And in coming home, as he neared, the father saw him and ran out to meet him. And the son began groveling, Father, I've sinned against heaven and on earth. I'm no longer fit to be your son. Let me be a servant. And his father lifted him up off the ground and said, 
that's ridiculous. You're my son. And he gave him a ring for his finger and a, and a, clo- a, a coat for, uh, to put over his shoulders and decided to kill the fatted calf and have a party for his son was lost. And now he's found. Now, the older son who stayed at home didn't come to the party. He, he, he was wondering what was happening. And the servant says, that brother of yours, he's come home. But he refused to come to the party. So the father went to him as well. And he said, come to the party. Your, your brother was lost and he's found he's home. And it's right we rejoice. But the older son had a hard time understanding what grace was all about. How the son who wasted his father's inheritance could be accepted back home. Now, these stories were told in the context of Pharisees and religious leaders who were complaining about who Jesus spent time with, that Jesus spent time with people who were less than perfect. They were people who the religious, righteous people would think were not worth spending time with. I mean, after all, we tell, don't we tell our children, be careful about who you spend time with? You don't want to have that rub off on you. And so we can understand that somewhat, what the Pharisees are saying. But Jesus is wanting them to know some very important things about who his father is. So what does that tell us? In each story, let's look at what we see. In each story, something's lost. As far as the sheep are concerned, one of them wanders away. Or maybe one of them was just left behind as the sheep moved on. As far as the coins, one of the coins just fell out of the pocket. Sometimes Things and people are lost without us even realizing it, like a coin falling out of your pocket into the cushions of the sofa. And then two of the sons chose to be lost. And I say two because I think both those sons had a sense of lostness about them. One was lost far away from home, and the other kind of lost his understanding about the character of his father, even though he was home. Now, in each story, we also understand that what was lost had value. And this is the hard thing to understand. Because when we begin to look at people um, who are not in the church, sometimes the church can get an attitude toward people as if those who are not there, those who are not a part of the Christian community, those who have never come to a relationship with God um, are really not that important, really. We'll just focus in on our own folks. And Jesus is letting us know that those who are lost have extreme value. In fact, the sheep had, the one lost sheep had such value, the shepherd was willing to risk the 99 in the open country in order to find the one. The woman, the coin was so valuable, she, she wasted a whole day. She took a whole day to find that coin. And the sons, well, The sons had value, we discovered, because the father wanted them to come and celebrate together to be part of that community. Each was celebrated after they were found, which means that each one of those things that were lost has value. One of the things that God's reminding us in this parable is that those people who we might think are lost or label as lost, those people who we might think are lost causes, have value to God as they are. And that our task is to make sure we find a way to find them. See, people become lost very easily. And we become the prodigal sons and daughters every time we search for unconditional love where it cannot be found. It's easy for any of us to try to end up being lost to being prodigal. And so we have to make sure that we are understanding those that are lost. Also, in each story, That which was lost is found. After careful search sometimes, and sometimes after waiting, the father didn't go out and search for the son to drag him home. He knew better than that. I mean, we know what it would be like if our father came after we left and said, you got to come home. And we would say, no, we can make it on our own. That for human beings, sometimes we have to wait and allow them to come home. There is a time for searching. For those who've wandered away, perhaps, or those who've been left behind even. But for those who sometimes willfully go away, there's a time to wait. But when they make that turn and begin to walk home, as soon as we see them crest the hill, we run out 
and we meet them halfway. Not with a lecture, not with the finger pointing, but with the grace that God has given to us. The shepherd seeks the sheep, the woman seeks the coin, the father waits and then goes to the sons. And of course, in each story, there's a sense of joy. A party is thrown. There is joy in finding that which is lost. It's, it's an exciting time. I love our baptisms because part of our baptisms is celebrating, is cheering. I remember growing up in a church, you didn't cheer really that much, but we want to cheer. We want to celebrate for the decisions that people make. We want to celebrate for people saying yes to Jesus. One of the problems that the oldest son had was that he felt the acceptance of the younger son may have been the rejection of the older. He may have felt rejected because the father never gave him a party for him and his friends. But the father simply said, all you had to do is ask. Everything I have is for you. And we need to understand that God's acceptance of those who've been far away and to bring them close is not a rejection of those who have been faithful since they were babies. I've been in the church since, since I was a baby, coming to Christ when I was 12 and, and continuing on in the faith ever since them, ever since then. That doesn't mean I resent the fact that some people went out and sold their wild oats or did whatever they wanted to do. And then when they come back into the church, they have the same standing as I do. For the ground is even at the foot of the cross. And we celebrate them more than would celebrate me, who's been a Christian for all these years. And it's proper for that. But that doesn't mean that the father is not filled with joy when he looks at me as well. Also, we see in each story that the character of God is revealed. Neither of the sons knew or understand the loving character of the father. Neither of the sons fully understood the grace of God. Now, the younger son went away, but there's something about being raised in that home that he, he knew the father was a good man. He was accepting, but he didn't understand the fullness of the grace. He only saw that God could, well, maybe accept him a little bit, but not fully. He didn't fully understand the full character of God's grace, which is ready to accept him the moment he turns around and walks back home. The same way, the older son, who's been home all these years, spending all this time around his father, didn't understand that the father's grace reached out to him too. The older son thought that he was earning it by duty, that somehow by his dutiful working in the farm all those years, the father should have paid him something for that, should have given him a party without his asking. He didn't understand the grace of God was that anything was there for the taking, that God wanted to offer grace to him as well. He simply had to ask. Neither understood fully the grace of God. The character of God values those who are lost. The character of God gives grace to those uh, um, who are lost. See, grace is a hard thing for us, I think, as we think about grace. Receiving grace for ourselves is sometimes very difficult because we feel we have to earn back God's trust. You know, we fail, we fail, we fail. And finally, we may say, you know, I've messed up too much. Um, I've got to earn this. So I'll, when I get my life right, I'll come back to God. No, that's not how it works. And that's not how grace works. Grace is the gift of God, not based on you getting your life right or earning it. It has to do with God's gift of grace. He, he reaches it out to you. That's what Easter's about. Easter's not just about the, the celebration of Jesus resurrecting. It's a celebration of the grace and gifting of God. But also, grace given by God can be offensive when we look at it given to somebody else. I think there's times when we see somebody else accepted and we think, that's kind of offensive. Don't they have to earn their way back in? See, we, we, we won't say that word, but we think it. And it becomes offensive to us when we see people who have wasted their lives or done evil things turning back toward God. We don't really want to accept them, but God does. See, his grace is sometimes offensive because it goes far beyond what we understand his character is. These stories lay out plainly his character. Now, as in all stories that Jesus tells, we have to ask ourselves, where do we sit in the story? Where is it that we sit? 
See, so the, these parables are not just stories with a lesson like Aesop's fables. They're more powerful than that. When we look at these stories, we have to ask ourselves, where in the story do we sit? For instance, in the stories, in these three stories that Jesus is telling, do you think you sit next to Jesus pointing your fingers at the religious legalists who are um, pushing away people who are lost? Maybe, maybe that's where you find yourself sitting. And maybe you think by sitting with Jesus and pointing at them, saying you need to accept other people that, that you're on the right side. But you have to be careful here because in doing so, you could become the next Pharisee because we're not receiving them in grace. Maybe you find yourself sitting with the Pharisees, that maybe you're the kind of person who looks with suspicion at those who have kind of made a mess of their lives and come back to God, who have um, sinned or turned away from God, maybe even vocally turning away from God, but coming back, we might look at them with suspicion and not wanting to fully trust them or accept them back into the community of faith. To you, if that's where you find yourself sitting, Jesus is saying, you have to remember my father's character, which is the giving of grace. Maybe, and maybe most of us find ourselves sitting with the tax collectors and sinners. And we're hearing, maybe for the first time, but maybe for the hundredth time, the welcoming and forgiving message of the grace of God. And as we think about this Easter on, and we think about resurrection and all that God did in order that we might be forgiven and welcomed into his family, we're filled with so much joy at the reception of that gift. We just want to shout out and celebrate and say, yes, this is the gift that God has given to us. And this is what Easter is all about. See, when we sit, with the tax collectors and the sinners. We see, we experience, and we understand the grace of God. See, that's Easter. That's celebration. Essentially, Easter speaks to our need of forgiveness and God's desire to do whatever it takes to make sure that we have it. I pray for you this Easter. I pray that this Easter you'll really understand the grace of God. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to uh, come to church to receive it. You can just right where you're at say, okay, God, I recognize I can't earn the right to be with you. I can't earn my forgiveness, but I can receive it by faith. I confess that I'm a sinner. And I thank you for giving me the gift of grace as I believe in you. Simple prayer from your heart. I pray that you begin your Easter with that. And then the rest of the day, (laughs) celebration. May you experience the joy of Jesus during this day. Will you join me in prayer? Almighty God, this is an amazing thing what you've done. We celebrate resurrection. We even celebrate your death, not, not in gloating over it, but being thankful for it. We celebrate all that, but more than anything else, we celebrate the purpose of it, which is in order that we might have a relationship with you through grace, not earned, but given. And we thank you for that. And so we do celebrate on this day. We celebrate your love. We celebrate your forgiveness. We celebrate your grace, knowing that you long all of your create for all your creation to be drawn back to you. Thank you for being patient. And not being in a hurry to come again. Because there's so many others who today need to know your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's been a great day. I hope it's a good beginning to our day. I pray that as you go throughout the rest of this day, that you'll experience that grace of God. That there'll be this sense of joy that keeps flooding back into your heart over and over again. Don't forget that in the midst of your meal and your family and everything else you're going to do today. In the midst of eggs and candy and sweetness and naps and all, don't forget. Allow that grace to continue to bubble up so that your joy today might be complete. Uh, Hang on at the end here. We have some announcements on what things are happening in the the midst of the church. Um, And so uh, just uh, we invite you to be a part of what we're doing here at Judson. May God watch over you. 
May you experience God's peace and God's joy. May you see him wherever you go, to the left, to the right. May you see him when you look up and when you glance at the ground. No matter what you do and where you go, may God's grace be right in front of you. Go in peace.